Hello, I would like to welcome all of you to the first keynote talk of SIGRAPI. Today, I, would, I have the honor to introduce Professor James Gain from the University of Cape Town. Professor Gain did his bachelor and master's degree in computer science at Rhodes University in South Africa. And in 2000, he obtained his PhD from the University of Cambridge. He's a former president of the African Computer Graphics Association, AFRIGRAPH. And his research focuses on computer graphics, high performance computing, human computing interaction, virtual reality, and visualization. More specifically, in computer graphics, he has done some very nice contributions on procedural and geometric modeling to create natural scenes and objects more efficiently. And today, Professor Gain will be talking about authoring digital landscapes for computer games. I am looking forward to his presentation, as I'm sure all of you are. So please welcome Professor Gain. Hello, everyone. My name is James Gain from the University of Cape Town in South Africa. And the topic of my talk for today is going to be authoring digital landscapes. This basically is the question of how do we create convincing natural scenes for virtual environments, film and games. Surprisingly, this has been a topic of research interest for more than 40 years, ever since the advent of Mandelbrot's fractal landscapes. And yet it remains of current interest mostly because it's so challenging. In this talk, I'm going to be covering two things. First of all, what tools do we use to create these authoring environments? And once we've created a particular authoring environment, how do we check that it's actually effective or not? It's worth starting by defining exactly what I mean by a digital landscape. This is everything that goes into the effective portrayal of a natural environment. So we would start with the bare underlying earth, usually represented as a height field, all of the hills and erosion channels that might make up that landscape, onto which you'd put overlying detail. So that would be grass, snow, extending all the way up to a complete e ecosystem consisting of trees and plants. You'd of course also want to represent the skyscape with all its weather, clouds, rain, lightning, and so on. This has application in a broad range of areas. This goes from games through film to virtual reality training. All of these use natural scenes in different ways. Sometimes it's just a backdrop meant to evoke a certain aesthetic or emotion. And other times it has a central role. Think flight simulators, where the, the actual weather would control how you might respond in terms of piloting a plane. Let me talk a little bit about the workflow and the pain involved in designing and developing these natural scenes. And notice that most of my talk is about the authoring aspect, so it focuses on the geometry and the textures and those sorts of things, and less on the rendering side. That's not to say that there aren't significant challenges for rendering. Um, it's just that the focus will be on the, the authoring side here. So typically what happens is that you'll have some kind of game design process, and that design will dictate what the environments are going to look like. Then the designers and artists will go through a phase of doing pre-visualization where they'll gather reference material. This could be photographs. They might even take, for example, a trip out to the site that they're trying to model or some form of inspiration and take videos and photographs there. Then during development, the digital artists will create scenery assets. And this combines the geometry texture and some animation. For example, evolving clouds or wind swaying the trees and so on. The important point is that this is extremely labor intensive. This is why AAA games typically have hundreds of digital artists involved for months and years at a time. A typical tree, for example, might have upwards of 500,000 vertices if you want to model it with any kind of detail. And that would be at least 20 hours of work for an artist to create. And that's an artist that is quite experienced in creating digital natural assets. The point of all of this is that we want to make the artist's workflow as smooth and efficient as possible, while not getting rid of any of the control and freedom that they might have to express their artistic desires. I think that there really are three goals for landscape authoring. Uh, and the trick is really to achieve all of those three things at the same time. So in terms of Venn diagram, we want to sit at the center where those three aspects overlap. And that's the real challenge here, trying to achieve those three goals simultaneously. 
So the goals are plausibility, efficiency, and controllability. I use plausibility instead of realism because we want to deal with the perception of the user experiencing the environment rather than absolute realism. Unfortunately, that's a lower goal and it's easier to achieve than, than true realism. Controllability is all about giving the artists control over how the environments are specified. And efficiency is that the algorithms that are used to create this environment need to be as fast as possible. So there's a tight feedback cycle between the artist and the environment creation. Let me look at each of these three in a bit more detail. All thing control is really on a spectrum, ranging from the left where you have complete automation. So that'd be, for example, a situation where you might give a single pseudo random number to your procedural generation method, and it might create an entire world out of that. On the right hand side, we have complete control. That's a case where every single vertex in your billion vertex environment is specified individually by the, the author or artist. And those are the two extremes and other techniques fit in between that. So traditionally and historically, we've had things like parameter setting, where you might specify the noise function that's used to create a terrain using examples. So you provide to the system uh, exemplar terrains and it generates something that looks quite similar. And in the middle ground, we have sketching, painting and sculpting interfaces which deliberately take the traditional media that are used by artists and translate them into a digital setting. And then slightly more to the complete control situation is traditional modeling uh, using things like constructive solid geometry to create your scenes. I like to divide this into three categories. There's what I call the lazy spot, which means that there's less work for the artist, but at the same time, they can't really do exactly what they want necessarily. Then there is the sweat spot. We have to work really hard to create the large scale schemes that they need. And in the middle is the desirable point, which is the sweet spot. Perhaps a little bit more about this. So that sweet spot represents a perfect combination between automation and control that allows the artist to, to balance the amount of work that they do and the control that they have over the environment. It's also worth noting that we really want to do this at a variable scale. So sometimes when you're using the interf easy interfaces, you want to do broad scale sweeping changes. Maybe you'll have a, a brush that will dictate the style of the ecosystem in some way. And that might span tens of kilometers with a single sweep. But sometimes artists want to control specific details. A single tree, a single hero tree might be what they want to control in terms of exact shape and how it leans and the kind of foliage it has. And at this sweet spot, we are inspired by the traditional mechanisms of sculpting, sketching, and painting. Efficiency is important only insofar as it affects the authoring experience. So the circumstance here is that we have an artist making a change and then the system responding by altering the environment. And that time needs to be reduced to as small as possible. There's a huge difference between real-time response, where you could, for example, paint a particular style over the landscape, as you can see here on the right, and that change is affected almost instantaneously, versus something that takes more than 30 seconds to take effect. And obviously, we really want real-time response. We can live with interactive response, that's 0.1 of a second up to five seconds, uh, but anything more than that seriously impacts on the authoring experience and the effectiveness of the way in which artists make changes. And the final goal is plausibility. So whoever's experiencing or viewing the environment needs to believe it to be real. And that, of course, is not the same thing as it being truly realistic in the sense of it undergo, having undergone effects such as erosion or growth factors and things like that. So the viewer's perception trumps the true physical realism which is an advantage to us because it's much easier to do that. But it does mean that we need to know and understand how viewers perceive environments. And that makes evaluation far more tricky. Currently, there are really three ways to evaluate environments in terms of its plausibility. One is the so-called pretty picture approach, uh, which is quite prevalent in graphics and often looked down on by people outside of the domain. It's called proof by demonstration. <laughs> 
And you can do that, but you should do more. You can look at emergent physical properties as a form of validation. So you, for example, can, uh, if we're looking at a terrain, look to see if there are no endoic basins. That has to do with the fact that water runs off and doesn't necessarily pool uh, in certain areas of the environment, or at least not extensively. Uh, there's often sort of channels and, and flow out and off the edge of an environment in order for it to be realistic. So we can look at those kind of emergent physical properties as a proxy for plausibility. And finally, we could do user experiments. I said with caveats here, because actually what you want is uh, users who are somewhat experienced or have expertise in the domain, because they have a finer eye. You don't want to necessarily have uh, just people off the street, particularly not people who spend a lot of time playing computer games rather than being out in the natural environment. Because there's a strange effect where they are actually influenced by the natural environments they see in computer games, um, and they actually have a lower bar than somebody who's truly experienced in walking nature or uh, a botanist or a geologist or something like that. So choose the people you run the experiments on uh, quite carefully. Obviously, the difficulty here is that user experiments are quite time consuming, and they're not really that prevalent in the research environment at the moment, even though they should be. Now that we have a good idea of what it is we're trying to achieve, the next question is, how do we actually go about achieving it? And historically, there have been three broad methods for authoring landscapes. The earliest one is a procedural approach, uh, then it developed into simulation approaches, and more recently, we've taken data-driven approaches, often based on artificial intelligence techniques. But in fact, it turns out that the best approach is some kind of combination of those three. And when I show you some examples from my own work, you'll see that this hybrid approach is actually quite successful. Let's look at each of these three in turn. Procedural methods rely on examining the artifact that you're trying to produce and inferring some kind of simple algorithm for actually creating that overall effect. And examples of this, traditionally things like noise, fractals, that's for creating self-similar landscapes, or lindemeyer systems for creating trees. Quite often, the interfaces for these are sketching and painting uh, approaches. And if we were to consider these according to those three criteria for a successful authoring system, we'd be able to say that they're quite efficient because the algorithms are relatively simple. Results tend not to be that plausible because we select a few key visual effects and not able to achieve some of the more subtle ones. An example of this would be with terrains. So you can see on the right-hand side, they look okay, but they do not have the correct drainage patterns that terrains would evidence in practice. So these techniques tend to be less plausible, although they are highly controllable because you can build the interface into the procedural method. What about simulation techniques? Well, here we are actually doing things like erosion channels. Uh, we're simulating the growth of plants. And so we tend to get fairly plausible outcomes. It's not that controllable, because the traditional simulation, you basically specify the starting or initial conditions, then run the simulation. And it's quite hard to say what the final outcome is going to be without doing some kind of iteration. So that's definitely a weakness. They can be quite slow, but there have been some examples of a GPU acceleration to make them near real time or perhaps interactive. Example of this are hydraulic erosions over terrains, or using individually based models for ecosystems that are taken from the botany literature. And the final one is the data-driven approach. So here we take existing landscapes uh, and we learn from them to create new ones. And this would typically be using things like machine learning, or in the case of ecosystems, we could treat plants as circular disks and learn the typical distributions of plants of different species relative to each other. The interfaces here tend to be sketching and painting. And this has the best chance of achieving our three goals. It tends to be fairly efficient. It can be made controllable. And on the whole, it's plausible. One caveat in that regard is that it's plausible often at a local level, but the global characteristics are not necessarily obeyed. And that's something I think that needs further work in terms of research. So these are the three techniques. Let's see how we can apply combinations of these techniques in a hybrid method uh, 
to achieve the three goals. And I'll look at two examples of these. My first case study combines procedural methods and simulation to model skyscapes. So this is the problem of creating an animated representation of clouds and their interaction, wind, rain, sunlight, all these meteorological effects. And the purpose here is to convey both mood, but also aspects of time and day and season. In fact, it's been rather poorly executed in the past. There's definitely room for improvement in, in the methods applied here. Our specific goals with this research were to create a deep interactive representation of weather for virtual worlds. Let me break down exactly what this means. First of all, a deep representation says that we want to actually simulate the underlying causes of the phenomena. That means you need to take, keep track of things like moisture, temperature, the interaction of the landscape with the atmosphere and so on. We want to create weather, and this means not just the representation of clouds, as has been done in the past, but also things like wind and secondary effects, such as moisture being condensed to rain and snow and lightning and so forth. Our interest, of course, in terms of efficiency is, as I said, with one of those three guiding principles, to try and make this as interactive as possible. This means that the simulation time steps should take at most one to seven seconds. And the virtual world needs to be significant in size. So we're talking a sort of typical game area of 10 kilometers by 10 kilometers. This is what's known as meso scale in simulation terms with a resolution of about 512 by 512 uh, horizontally. So that's the, the ground resolution. And we'd also like to have a variety of different underlying landscapes, such as mountains, lakes, cities, and so on. Here's an overview of the final system we developed. It has a number of stages. And the important thing here is to note that there's a combination between simulation and procedural amplification. So simulation is how we get the deep underlying representation, and amplification is how we deal with making this an interactive system, uh, because the underlying representation is actually relatively coarse. So we start off on the left with a layered model. Instead of representing uh, the sky as a dense volumetric, evenly sampled space, we instead use layers. So these uh, are regular in the horizontal and irregular in the vertical. And this is possible because the skyscape is often uh, constructed around layers. This is the levels at which the different clouds form. So it's a very natural representation. That layered representation feeds into a simulation, which is a Eulerian grid-based simulation, which is easily exploitable for, for GPU implementation. And that represents the actual physical effects, such as convection, which is when you have a vertical circulation of, uh, of temperature and other effects. Um, advection, which is the in-plane wind-based effects. Phase change, for example, where the moisture gets condensed out of the atmosphere to form clouds. From that relatively coarse representation, we drive actual clouds using a procedural upsampling technique. So within a given cell of our simulation, we identify the kind of cloud that's going to appear there and use a noise function to represent that cloud, which finally leads on to rendering. We take each of those phases in turn, starting with the atmospheric simulation. So this uses, as I said, a sparse stack of two-dimensional layers with a divergence-free advection of several quantities which are related to cloud simulation, namely temperature, humidity, and water content. We need to be able to change between humidity and water through cycles of evaporation and condensation. And there are formulae for these. Our course representation represents each grid cell at a 200 by 200 meter resolution. There are exchanges of these quantities, namely the temperature, humidity, and water between the stacks in our layers. And to do that, we use something from meteorology, which is the moist static energy equation. And that relates these temperatures at different levels. On the right, you can see some representations of this. So we have uh, three stacks of temperature, T2, T1, T0. The velocity fields represented in the middle with V0, V1, and V2, showing the direction of, of wind in this uh, atmospheric layer representation. And the uplift field, which relates between V0 and V1, and V1, and V2, shows the transfer between layers. So red would be an upward transfer and blue a downward transfer. 
This representation and simulation allows us to have various interesting effects. So for example, we can have the transfer of moisture between the lowest layer, which is the landscape, and the first layer of the air. And so you would have, for example, uh, moisture carried from lakes and the sea into the atmosphere. Also, different land types uh, affect the atmosphere in different ways. So if it's bare rock, for example, it's going to give off more heat, therefore causing more uh, uplift and convection. And typically you might, for example, get cumulus clouds forming above such areas. We also simulate the case where uh, the wind is forced upwards by the slope of mountain sides and you get condensation and cloud formation as that, uh, that air is carried upwards into cooler layers. This is typical of uh, mountainous areas. For example, where I live in South Africa, we have a layer of cloud forming on the top of a flat table mountain. That's called the tablecloth. And it's an example of orographic uplift, which we can simulate with our system. For procedural upsampling, we take these coarse simulation grids and add extra volumetric detail. So we identify within each cell what kind of cloud is going to be formed. And we do this using a cloud classification scheme. And that relates the convectivity of a particular cell to its altitude. And usefully, this is a very common taxonomy for, for clouds and relates very strongly to their appearance. So if, for example, if you have a lot of upward circular convection and uh, your cells spanning different altitudes, you might get a cumulonimbus cloud forming. Whereas if it's low altitude and low convectivity, you'd have those thin stratus clouds. So we can use that as the parameters for our procedural upsampling. But this scheme is a combination then of simulation and procedural techniques. Let me just show you some uh, resulting animations from our system. This particular example demonstrates the formation of different cloud types within a simulation. Here we have four different layers and the formation of a mixture of cumulus, cirrus, and stratus clouds. In this example, we have the wind driving moist air from the left to the right across and up the slopes of a mountain, forming clouds as it does so. And finally, we have the characteristic formation of cumulus clouds above a hot island over the course of a day as the moist air is driven upwards and convects. In summary, in terms of techniques, this combines simulation with procedural upsampling methods. It managed to achieve plausible, realistic results that we are able to validate against expected behavior, and it's relatively efficient. Where it is lacking is in terms of control. Because it's fundamentally based around a simulation method, uh, we have issues with achieving exactly what the user desires. It's possible to set up initial conditions, wind directions, sort of moisture layers, and so on, and do some painting onto the individual layers in terms of temperature control, but it's not as finely tuned in terms of user authoring as I would like. There's still more to do in this regard. My second case study involves the placement of plants on a landscape. This is the so-called eco-placement problem. Specifically, what it involves is for large-scale ecosystems, positioning individual trees assigning attributes such as their age, their canopy extent, and their species. What it doesn't involve is specifying the actual geometry of those plants. We take this as a solved problem. You could, for example, use L systems to create an individual tree. The problem as it is, is sufficiently challenging without considering that aspect. We'd also like to be able to interactively edit and recreate these forests according to an authoring system. And you can see here a quick example from our system where in the top left, there's an image of the user's sketch. The dark red areas are dense forest and the light areas are a more sort of shrub-like, somewhat more open forest area. And that's mirrored in the actual forest that is created. Let's look at the system that is behind this. So it's a framework that allows interactive editing and you can see an editing session here on the right hand side where dense brushes are painted onto the scene, followed by a light or sparse area. On the bottom left, the corresponding forest that matches to that has been shown. And the kinds of landscapes we can have range from one kilometer squared to nine kilometer squares in size. The interactivity, it's about five seconds to 80 seconds to create an individual forest. And here you can see it just painting densely over the entire area. 
and what the results would be. And this is a flyover of the scene, just to give you an indication of the, the kind of results that you can get if you do a post-process render. What is the system that actually achieves all of this? Well, here's the pipeline. It takes in an elevation as a height field, and it uses sketch, which can be interactively changed. We then generate a canopy height model. This basically specifies for a given cell on the landscape what the height of the canopy is. And that's done using a data-driven approach. In particular, we use CGANs to learn the mapping from the elevation and the sketch to the canopy height. Once that is in place, we need to specify the position of individual trees that match the canopy height. And we use an iterative Voronoi-like process to achieve that. That, of course, doesn't completely define an ecosystem because an ecosystem doesn't just consist of the canopy, but also requires undergrowth and grass. For undergrowth, we have a pre-processed simulation that we draw on, and that allows us to map from the canopy plants and species to the particular undergrowth that might appear in those areas. Finally, the grass is placed and there's a post-processed render. Let me look at some of the early stages. So here's the data-driven canopy approach. We map from a terrain and a user sketch. You can see on the top left with the indication of dense and sparse regions to the canopy height in the middle, and finally to the placement of individual canopy trees. We have a CGAN trained neural net for the sketching and digital elevation model inputs being mapped to the canopy heights. And then we have a iterative process in which a Voronoi spacing is achieved for the trees. That process relies on the abiotic conditions of the landscape. So exactly how the light falls on the landscape in terms of sunlight, mm -hmm. how moisture from rainfall affects the landscape, all of those things affect where individual canopy trees are placed according to their species. As a pre-process, we simulate ungrowth on pre-populated canopy tree placements, and we'll have a bank or database of these available to us. This process considers individual undergrowth trees with the prior of the canopy tree placements, and we do things like uh, seeding growth mortality simulation at individual monthly time steps. Unfortunately, this process can take several hours to complete, up to six or seven hours. So it really isn't viable to run it during design. Fortunately, what we can do is we can take the outputs of these simulations and use them as a inputs to a sampling process that gets targeted to the landscape in question. A little bit about the performance and validation. Uh, we did compare our results to Google Map results for the Sonoma County area, which is where we got much of our source data. You can see on the top left that the Google map output matches quite well to our results on the top right uh, in terms of where plants are placed up against slopes. For example, west facing slopes get, tend to get more plants in the Sonoma County area than the, the east facing slopes. In terms of performance, we can achieve a reasonable performance on really large landscapes for many, many trees. So we could have a three kilometer by three kilometer landscape with uh, almost five and a half million trees and the total time for canopy placement and undergrowth synthesis is around a minute. Now, this isn't entirely interactive, but it is very acceptable performance given the large scales involved. Where does the system fit in terms of my taxonomy of evaluation? Well, as you've seen, it's a combination of a data-driven AI-based approach for the creation of the canopy with a synthesis based on simulation for where the undergrowth is placed. It doesn't involve any procedural methods per se. It has actually a good combination of plausibility, controllability, and efficiency. So for smaller scale landscapes, you can have interactive performance. It's possible to use sketches and other kinds of controls that I haven't mentioned to specify the landscape. And the results, as you can see from these images, are quite plausible. To summarize then, um, this talk has been based on two papers, which you can see uh, mentioned in the reference list here. But if you're interested in this, this area in general, uh, there are a number of other papers that you can access uh, from myself and my co-authors. I just want to summarize to say that the important thing here is that we want to achieve this trifecta of controllability, efficiency, and plausibility. And the way that we do this is we hybridize a combination of procedural methods, data-driven methods, and simulation. Thank you for your attention.
Okay, so thanks, James. It's been a really interesting presentation. I've learned a lot about uh, clouds, which I didn't know. <laughs> um, I will start with a question about your, the, the second part of your presentation, um, the one on landscapes. And you've mentioned all the, um, you know, in detail how plants can be more or less located over the terrain and how they will be, uh, the system will decide where to set them based on uh, the amount of light they get, the amount of moist, and so on. But um, what about the uh, relationships between plants? You know, sometimes there's certain type of plants that tend to grow um, at the bottom of, an, uh, of a specific type of tree and things like this. So can can the mm -hmm. system capture that uh, currently, or have you thought about how to incorporate this in the system? Uh, we have. Um, some of those effects are actually very subtle. Um, and you actually have to have a very complicated uh, simulation in order to encode them. So, for example, with pine trees, because they make the soil quite acidic with their needles, that can dictate certain plants. So, rather than make an incredibly detailed simulation, what we do is we, we create um, something called subbiomes. So, this is like a package of okay. uh, a species that actually occur together. So, they, they co occur, and that's how you ensure that, that you get the, exactly the effect that you talk about. So, for instance, because we use Western California, because there's a lot of data there, um, redwood trees, Western sword ferns, um, and various other species all occur mm -hmm. together. We just make sure they're, they're in the same sub-biome package uh, in our simulations. So, rather than having it occur naturally, we basically um, force it to occur. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Very nice. So it is accounted for. Oh, all right. Okay. All right, so I will go now with some of the questions that have been uh, posted on WOVA. The first one is by Daniel uh, Perazzo. He said, um, how is the research on systematic quantitative evaluation methods um, for, landscape and, for landscapes and skyscapes? I think I that's a, how it's a really... Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was going to say it's a really great question because to some extent it's actually an unanswered question. Um, so one of the ways we do it at the moment is we look for uh, measures of validation from the other fields. So we go to geomorphology, we go to botany, um, we go to meteorology, and we look at how they validate their simulations and try and make sure that ours follow the same, the same things. Um, but actually, that's more than you need for graphics sometimes. Um, so what you're really interested in is how does that uh, that plausibility? How does that uh, realism, that validation, actually affect plausibility from the viewer's perspective? And the best we have at the moment is to actually run a, a qualitative user study to test that. But what I'd be quite interested in, and I think this is a very viable research area, is to say, can we do some quantitative measure that um, does the same thing without having to go all the way to doing an expensive and time-consuming user study? So are there things that we can use from perception uh, that are particularly important in how you view a landscape, um, that we make sure that they, they occur, and then that solves our problem in a sense. So um, we do have some ways of doing this, is my answer, but there's definitely more research that can happen in this area. OK, uh, thank you for that answer. So the next question is by Vinicius uh, Ferreira. And he's asking, um, how can the techniques you described be used for specific interactions such as digging the earth, explosions, terrain deformations, etc.? Would the artistic system interact with physics systems, or would this be better handmade by the artist? Uh, it depends on your application. Um, so if you're wanting to do this, for example, in a live, in a video game, uh, for example, let's say a, a comet impacts the Earth and you want to show the effects of that live, uh, then you'd have to go to probably a physics approach to solving it. Um, but if you're doing it at the pre-processing, the modeling stage, so let's assume that the comet is, or whatever has already hit the Earth and you're showing an environment where it's already, already occurred, then I think it's really important to put the uh, controls in the hands of the user. Um, and for me, I think... Uh, the problem with simulation as it stands is it's really difficult to control. Um, so it's quite hard, for example, to say you want a river in a certain location, but then force all the erosion to, to follow that. 
possibly easier with the sort of things where you have digging and uh, and things impacting the surface, then maybe simulation would work. But more subtle things, uh, simulation often doesn't give you the right kind of control. Um, so it's these hybrid techniques. That's that's one of the things I think is is a real benefit where you can decide what technique works under what circumstances. That's what you you need to try and achieve. So a combination of simulation and procedural methods and data-driven approaches, I, I found to be very successful. Okay, thank you. Okay, so then Soraya moves, it's a little bit related to the question with the previous one. Um, can you simulate the impact of human on the landscape clouds? Uh, for example, no, in, in the case that a human is uh, just altering, I guess, uh, the clouds due to pollution, buildings, and, and so on. Uh, so, yes, we did that to some extent. Uh, so we account for the different kinds of surfaces that you have on the landscape and how that affects uh, clouds. So, for example, cities actually have a very defined uh, effect on, on clouds um, because they tend to give off a fair amount of heat. Um, so uh, we do actually have a different attribute for that landform as opposed to a forested area or, uh, or a water surface. They, they all interact um, with the with the clouds in a different way. Uh, we didn't account for pollution, actually, but of course it does radically affect clouds. Um, I think it wouldn't be too difficult to add that in as as an extra term. Um, you're going to change things like uh, temperature, uh, aspects of how condensation happens, uh, the kinds of condensation you get with acid rain and things like that. It's a rather depressing topic. Maybe that's why we ignored it, but uh, yeah. <laughs> it's not directly in the, the current system at the moment. Okay, that's a very uh, good answer. Oh, good answer. Okay, so I can't see another one now. I was actually curious, you, you mentioned in your talk, um, the evaluation based on perceptual studies is extremely difficult sometimes to find, like you were saying, the right people to, to, to do these evaluations because they need to be experts depending on what it is that you're evaluating, whether it's the quality of the clouds or the quality of the of the landscape. Sometimes just any random person who doesn't go often to the mountain might not be a good um, a person to evaluate the, the quality. Um, I was wondering, yeah, how do you find the right people to evaluate the results? And also, we always look for plausibility and realism, but maybe there could be a, a, a scale depending what's what's going to be the, the final public of your of your results, no? whether it's going to be games or a, or a movie or something that is going to be used for, um, I don't know, to create uh, more important environments when it comes to the, the physics and so on. Uh, maybe you could just achieve le different levels of realism or different levels of plausibility. Is that possible? Um, hi, Nuria. Actually, um, you broke up a little bit there, so I'll try okay. and answer what I think you're asking because I just got little oh, bits I, and pieces of it. I, I can um, do a summary. So you, you want. It seems you were asking about the need for experts. Yeah, I mean the difficulty of finding um, experts for each okay, yes, specific. Please. Yeah, I was saying that um, sometimes maybe you don't need a very high level of realism. It depends on on the final use. OK, now James is cutting now. Hello, sorry, I don't know whether I'm having an internet problem or I was losing James. I'm really sorry, Nuria, but I can't hear. I think it's a bad connection on my side, possibly. Oh, okay, yeah, I lost you. I'm seeing if I can fix it. Otherwise, we might not be able to carry on. Okay. 
Uh, sorry, Nuri, can you hear me? I can hear you now. I cannot see you. Uh, I've turned it off because I'm worried about the data flow. Uh, and I'm very sorry about that. Um, I think you were asking about uh, the fact that we often need experts to do hmm. the evaluation. Um, and, and that's true. And in fact, it's it's been found that, that it makes a big difference, that they are, are really good at determining whether something is plausible or not, um, particularly if they've, uh, they've, they've studied in the field. So a geomorphologist or a botanist, they're going to be the ones that are, are best able to tell. And the problem is with a lot of users that they've spent a lot of time in virtual environments or playing games. And so sometimes what they think is real is what they've seen there rather than uh, what occurs in nature. So the best compromise for those two, between those two is to find somebody who likes to spend a little, um, so people who could walk in forests or, or spend time climbing mountains. They don't need to necessarily be uh, geomorphologists. They just need to have an appreciation of the real thing. And that's the people we try and use for our, for our user studies. Okay. But we don't always do user studies. We often rely on, on other methods. Right. Okay. Because I find it typically very difficult, like you're saying, to find the right people to evaluate the results and to focus on exactly what it is that you're evaluating, not just the uh, rendering, for example, no? like it might happen sometimes. Okay, so I don't see more questions right now on Uva or uh, YouTube. Um, is this, anybody else wants to ask some questions to James? Um, Okay. Uh, I think there was one question I saw there, uh, and oh, yeah, about the, the training training of the CGANs. Yeah, yeah, it just it just pop up in my exactly. Go ahead, please. Just pop up in my list. Uh, yeah. Okay. How so I. I um, Sorry. Sure. It it is actually quite tricky. Um, we in fact uh, tried quite a lot of alternatives in the way we designed the CGANs before we eventually established what was the correct and acceptable method um, for this. Fortunately, the particular thing we're doing, which is actually quite image-based, is suitable for CGANs. Um, I don't think it's uh, a good idea to try and apply it for more of the pipeline than we did. All we did is we applied it to the canopy height model, which is basically a top-down raster view of the heights of trees on a cell-based arrangement. So it was really very suitable for, for CGANs. And even then, my PhD student, who's the first author, uh, Conrad Kapp, he spent uh, several months actually iterating on getting that right. Um, so I totally agree with whoever asked that question that it is actually quite tricky to do. Um, but the results were, were worth it in our case. OK. Um, so OK, so Gandhi Alma is the next question. He's asking. Uh, uh, whether this kind of system is, is used in professional game development and virtual reality? You, do you know if your system could be currently used or whether it's been used in that kind of applications? Um, so uh, these two papers I talked about are 2020 work. So it, it hasn't yet obviously been taken on board. What I find is that it takes uh, about four or five years before it's, uh, it, it makes its way into industry. Um, but some earlier work, um, we're currently in discussions with um, some companies. This tends not to be directly uh, for the games companies, but it's for producers of um, tools that the games companies will use. So landscape editing tools, plant generation tools, they're the sort of people who approach us um, with an interest in actually developing this further. And yes, there is some, some interest in this regard. Okay, and actually well, following, I, following that question, any interest, I assume, uh, to have these kind of tools incorporated maybe in, in current game engines to further facilitate authoring these kind of environments? I'm, I'm referring to... I have by um, a games company. No, sorry. Um, a, a game developing software, like, you know, we have a sponsors in this conference, Unreal and Unity, so oh. that's the kind of platforms I yeah. would think would be interested. I think it'd make a great uh, Unreal or Unity plugin, actually, um, mm -hmm. this kind of thing. Um, so if somebody wants to take it further, I'm very happy <laughs> for them to do that. Uh, 
In fact, we're actually making the, the code for the, the landscape generator, the CGAN one. Um, we're going to put that online so people can take it in and develop it further if they want to. Okay, that would be fantastic. Yeah. All right, so yeah. I don't see more questions, and I think we are uh, just reaching the time. So I'm, I'm not sure um, whether we have time for one last question or, uh, or we need to move on to the next presentation. I'm not sure, James. <laughs> Okay, so there's one more question now from Daniel Perazzo. Uh, is there any effort on using water on landscapes, creating lakes and rivers, for example? Uh, yes, there is indeed. Um, so one of the papers from last year, uh, the, I'm a co-author on, it's from the Lyon team, um, that's Eric Durian Galang, um, is about uh, riverscapes. So exactly that particular topic. And you can look at my uh, publications page to, to get access to that. Um, what we don't do is the cycle of uh, clouds causing rain, causing rivers. Um, so a, a complete uh, virtual world yet. It's mostly separate components. Do the clouds get separately? Do the plants separately to some extent? But not a, a total. Uh, virtual world yeah that could okay but yes uh, you can find out more about this particular thing if you go to hello yes i'm here Oh, okay, sorry, I just, I cut again. Okay, sorry. Um, no, it's just I think we we need to finish this um, keynote now. So sure. thank you, James, for the presentation. It was very nice work, and it was nice to see you again. Nice to see you too, Mary. <laughs> okay. Maybe we can't right. meet face to face. I hope uh, I hope so, and without internet cuts, will be much better. <laughs> yes. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Bye. Bye, everyone. Right. Thanks for the good questions. Bye -bye. Great questions, in fact. Okay. Bye.